Good afternoon and welcome to yet another extremely topical and extremely timely AMET webinar. As you know, AMET is a premier think tank and policy institute in Washington, D.C. We do a lot more than our weekly webinars, which we're very happy to do, which goes into everyone's living rooms. Yet daily, we are on Capitol Hill and members of Congress and their foreign policy staffers have grown to rely on us and trust us for our in-depth, almost granular, granular level information about our voice, the voice of the Amet, the voice of the truth about what Israel is up against in that tough neighborhood in which she's forced to live. Um, we'd ask you to kindly consider a contribution in order to make all of our activities possible. Um, our writing, our daily visits to Capitol Hill, as well as um, our wonderful webinars where we have wonderful, wonderful experts such as our dear friend, Alex Trayman. From August 5th, um, for three days, approximately 1,100 rockets or missiles were launched from Gaza, from Page, Palestinian Islamic Jihad, into Israel. Um, as most of you are already aware, Page is an Iranian terrorist proxy organization. Um, Israelis in the north had as much as 60 seconds to go into their sealed room. And those living in the South had perhaps 15 seconds. And many of them chose to just live in their sealed rooms for over a week when the IDF started warning them about an oncoming avalanche of missiles. Um, Israel, Superior Intelligence Services, were able to predict and weaken most of Pidge's capabilities. Yet, um, last Thursday, the UN Human Rights Commissioner, Michelle um, Bacalet, has called um, the killing of children in Gaza. Recently, the IDF um, has um, admitted to the killing of five children in Gaza. Um, at the Jebaliya um, refugee camp. Um, some of this could rightfully be attributed to the fog of war. There are unfortunately always civilian ca casualties in any conflict, and Iranians have been killed in our conflicts um, recently in Iraq and Afghanistan. Also, um, as we've seen through the conflict, um, there has been a lot of jihad. How do we predict that this will turn out in the future? Here, to answer this and many more questions is our dear, dear friend, Alex Trayman. Alex Trayman is the managing director um, and the Jerusalem Bureau Chief of JNS.org. Alex has written scores and scores of wonderful articles, and he has his finger on the pulse of almost everything going on within the state of Israel and the Knesset. Um, he has also been the producer of a phenomenal award-winning win documentaries such as Iranian and Honor Diaries. Without any further ado, it's my profound pleasure to turn the podium over to Alex Treyman. Alex, could you contextualize all of this for us a bit? Um, yeah, I can try to do some contextualization. I'm also happy to uh, answer any of your questions. I'm also happy to run down a little bit of the chronology of events that took place. Um, it was a surprise. Um, I think to many Israelis that we were going to be fighting in Gaza again this year. Uh, one of the main statements, outgoing statements that uh, 
Naftali Bennett made before he turned over the government to to uh, Yair Lapid was that he had actually provided uh, a year of quiet along the Gaza border and that it was actually the quietest year that we have had um, in a long time. Of course, um, Israel was fighting in May 2021. Um, just about three weeks before Bennett became the prime minister and about five weeks after uh, Bennett left the chair of prime minister, we were fighting again. So there was a very temporary uh, quiet. Um, and I think that most Israelis had felt that we had some degree of deterrence established after the May 2021 fighting, which was primarily directed against Hamas. And for many years, uh, Israel has directed its hostilities in Gaza Strip specifically against Hamas and has named Hamas as the primary enemy there. And the, the real reason why you always mention Hamas as the primary enemy is because Hamas is the governing entity of the Gaza Strip. Uh, and they actually took over the Gaza Strip from uh, Mahmoud Abbas, the chairman of the Palestinian Authority, and his Fatah party uh, shortly after the disengagement from the Gaza Strip uh, in 2005 and have governed ever since. And so they are the responsible party for what happens in the Gaza Strip. And there's an idea that even if there are other terrorist factions like the Palestinian Islamic Jihad, uh, that the overriding party with responsibility for what takes place is Hamas. Um, so the, now I should note that uh, even before we get into it, that in 2005, um, that Gaza was actually closed off. Uh, rather, the 21 Jewish communities of Gush Katif, uh, which contained 10,000 Jewish residents, that Israel decided to um, unilaterally withdraw from the territory. It's called the disengagement. It was done by Ariel Sharon. Um, that this took place it was a very controversial decision, but a decision that was being argued that. This is what we need to do in order to gain security uh, with the Palestinians. This is what we need to do in order to take close to 2 million uh, Arab residents of Gaza sort of off the books of the state of Israel, that you know, we, we can change the demographic equation by you know, removing ourselves from the Gaza territory. And uh, the Israeli public was told that by pulling out that we would be able to actually create some kind of deterrence there and that the reason why we were being attacked was because of our presence there and at the same time that if we would leave uh that if we would be attacked we would we would just attack back and we'd go right back in now what what's important to note i think just from a bit of a, a spiritual perspective is that this uh move was implemented uh, by closing off the 21 communities of Gush Katif on uh, Tisha B'Av, the Jewish day of the 9th of Av, okay, and, uh, and this was in the secular year of 2005, and in fact that the the move itself to, to disengage was supposed to take place on Tisha B'Av. Now, Tisha B'Av, the 9th of Av, is, is a very uh, sad day on the Jewish calendar, um, and one in which many tragedies, including the destruction of the first temple and the second temple, took place on that day, and, and many others I actually wrote about in a piece. I'm not going to run through it. Um, but here we are in 2022, and on the very eve of Tisha B'Av, on, on Friday evening, this, this year we celebrated Tisha B'Av on Sunday, but actually the ninth day of the month of Av was on Shabbat. And on the very eve, the moments before Shabbat, we were now in another conflict uh, in the Gaza Strip, and, and one that I think relates back to the uh, or original sin of the disengagement, which took place in 2005. Here we are, uh, many years later, continuing to fight conflicts. Um, there were some new strategies that, that took place here. Uh, I'll get into some of those, um, and then maybe I'll, I'll move backwards and we'll run through some of the uh, some of the uh, chronology of the events. Um, as I mentioned, one of the things that we did here was we actually singled out uh, the entity of Palestinian Islamic Jihad as being the, the main entity here. Now, what was unique in terms of strategy is not just that we singled them out and targeted them, that in itself would have been uh, a new strategy, but we actually coordinated with Hamas uh, to make sure that Hamas would stay out of the fighting. So this actually was in and of itself a new, a new strategy. Instead of fighting Hamas or simultaneously fighting Palestinian Islamic Jihad and Hamas, uh, we were actually in coordination with Hamas and made sure that they would stay out 
of the hostilities. And what that did was protect them against our highly precise uh, airstrikes. And they knew that if they would attack, that we would take out their entire senior leadership, which is exactly what we did with the Palestinian Islamic Jihad. Uh, and they knew that this was the case because in May of 2021, I think Israel actually started a new um, generation, I would say, of fighting in Gaza, where really our surveillance uh, techn technology has improved dramatically. Um, we, we know who's running these terror organizations. We know where they are in real time. We know who they're communicating with. If anybody in the Gaza Strip thinks that um, we're not reading everything, every single message on their phone, whether that's on a encrypted chat like Telegram or Signal or whatever else, um, we're we're on top of it. We, we, we are reading, we are listening, we are watching. We know where all their phones are at any given time. We know, you know, if they're not carrying a phone and we know that they're with their son or with their wife, we, we're following their phones. Um, so we know where people are at any given time and we're able to attack with such precision and accuracy. It's unbelievable. You know, if there's a, if there is a commander of Palestinian Islamic Jihad on the fourth floor of a 10 story building, and we are able to identify that they're sitting at their dining room table like we can put a missile through the window of the dining room that's uh you know that's how precise um things are right now um and using the surveillance uh, what we saw in may of 2021 was that we're actually able to start generating targets in real time using artificial intelligence and this was a game changer a year ago um, that means that you're coming into a conflict with a certain list of targets that you might have um, from human intelligence or other forms of intelligence. Um, but if you want to keep going, you can actually be developing new targets in real time and pushing a button and striking those targets in real time. We did tremendous damage in May 2021, and Hamas understood that. And so they knew that we were going to now attack Palestinian Islamic Jihad, that we had specific objectives to take out their top leadership. And so Hamas, um, I think, very wisely stayed out from their perspective. Um, you have to ask a question strategically if it is wise for... Israel to be having that type of um, collaboration with Hamas. On the one hand, you know, maybe we're reaching a point where we've created such deterrence and we recognize that Hamas is the responsible body for uh, the governance of Gaza, that there are benefits to being in coordination and collaboration. Perhaps you can, uh, over time, use carrots and sticks to work with them and moderate uh, their behavior. At the same time, um, they are a terrorist organization. And what, what their own moderation does is it allows for more extreme terror entities that don't have any responsibility for governance in the Strip, such as Palestinian Islamic Jihad, uh, to do exactly that, be Palestinian Islamic Jihad, um, without any uh, bearance of responsibility uh, from the people, many of whom have been radicalized for years. Um, in Gaza, obviously, Hamas uh, has governed um, as a dictatorship. And you can imagine that the economic uh, mobility, upward mobility of citizens of Gaza is not very high. And when you're also taught, you know, extremist ideology, the ideology of jihad. So, you know, you can blame Hamas and many people do, but it's a lot easier to blame Israel. And so when you, that's when you get these other organizations like Palestinian Islamic Jihad rising up through the ranks and making it easy to recruit uh, young and angry uh, Palestinians who, you know, see the Zionist entity as being the, the premier enemy. Um, another one of the major strategies that we had here was to not go in with an open-ended uh, campaign and wait for the international community to, um, you know, to come down with condemnations and beg us to stop. And maybe part of this was also uh, launching the attack on uh, late on a Friday, uh, going into a weekend, um, understanding exactly what we wanted to accomplish inside Gaza, uh, making sure that we took out the top terror targets and the top leadership of uh, Palestinian Islamic Jihad, uh, which included their 
their northern commander and their southern commander. Um, that was uh, Taysir al Jabari, who's the northern Palestinian Islamic Jihad commander, and the southern commander, Khaled Mansour. We also um, took out many other senior, senior operatives. Um, but already by Sunday morning here in Israel, uh, you know, when a lot of people who were, let's say, you know, if you had religious uh, members of his, you know, here in Israel who kind of signed off at the very beginning uh, of the of the military campaign with the beginning of the Shabbat, um, you know, turn on back their TVs and their phones to see what happens on Saturday night. Um, already by Sunday morning, um, rumors were circulating widely that uh, Israel was ready to broker a ceasefire. And it was already by Sunday night that uh, Israel had announced that it did formally uh, broker a ceasefire, which then went into effect uh, on midnight between Sunday and Monday. But the idea of going in strong, taking out targets, um, achieving a limited set of important goals and then immediately coming out was a new strategy, I think, was very much designed in order to, um, uh, to increase deterrence, uh, to show the Israeli population here that it could attack and achieve uh, significant goals in a short period of time, and also to limit um, the international community's uh, condemnations to whatever extent that is possible, right? And we still had those, and we can talk about them in a, in a little bit. Um, another one of the strategies that uh, Israel implemented here, I think somewhat successfully, was releasing the details of the targets and the operations in as close to real time as possible. Like the second Israel hit a target, it immediately came out uh, saying, this is the target that we hit. These are the commanders that we took out. So you, the IDF was actually recognizing maybe for the first time that we're in a 24-hour uh, uh, Twitter social media cycle. And so followers of the hostilities were, were following the IDF's progress in real time. And what that allowed the world to do is, A, to understand that, you know, we're not firing indiscriminately into Gaza, that we're choosing very highly strategic targets. Um, and then also, it enabled us to counter false claims uh, in real time. So, for example, I think, Sarah, you referenced it, that in the, like, that there was, uh, there were many misfires. Uh, this is very important. I think it was like close to 200 uh, misfires from Hamas rocket, I mean, from Palestinian Islamic Jihad rockets fired into Israel. And uh, many of them just didn't clear the Gaza border. One of these took like a left turn and you can see it in the video um, and, and just struck in the uh, Jambalaya camp um, and actually killed six, six uh, civilians, including women and children. Um, and Israel was quick to actually have that footage. They, they're, they're showing you from the air where these missiles are going. So you see that missile that took a left turn on the screen and you see it? That's actually a, a missile that struck, um, that struck uh, civilians. And there was kind of like real-time counts of, of uh, militants and civilians that, that were taken out. Um, in terms of the overall um, damage, I think Israel took out about 49 uh, Palestinians. Uh, many of them were, were strategic targets, and some unfortunately were, um, were uh, civilian casualties, and some, as mentioned, were actually the casualties of um, Palestinian Is Islamic Jihad uh, rockets. Um, so Anyway, releasing the details in real time, I think, also helped the world see, you know, what Israel is trying to accomplish, how it goes about doing that. Um, and that's part of a, a new strategy to be more up to date, not just in firing, but also recognizing that it's not just the military battlefield, it's also the diplomatic battlefield that the IDF is, is fighting on. Um, some of the continued strategies, I mentioned the precision accuracy. Um, we talked about avoiding civilian casualties as much as possible. There are reports, and the IDF will tell you, and they have footage of this, where you can hear the, the pilots on the radio saying, um, you know, we see the target, but there are children playing in the area and we're not going to shoot. And in, in at least three different occasions, uh, the Air Force decided to hold its fire, waiting for civilians to clear the area so they would have a clean shot uh, and limit uh, collateral damage, civilian casualties. Make And, and this is one of the, the real 
uh, operational techniques of the IDF that makes the IDF one of the most moral, if not the most moral army um, in the entire world. Um, another one of our continued strategies, but one which really uh, shone bright uh, during this Operation Breaking Dawn was the success of the Iron Dome. Uh, and what you can see is over the years since Iron Dome has been put into action is that it's uh, effectiveness, uh, percentage capability of knocking out um, a uh, Qassam rocket or a projectile going towards Israel, the percentage of success rate has just gone way up. I mean, it already started a few years back, you know, in the high 80s and the idf was uh, announcing that they had between 96 and 97 percent success rate so the iron dome is able to in real time um, identify when a rocket is fired identify if it is going to hit an israeli population center if it is not uh it lets it go Right. Some of these things are just going towards open fields and we don't shoot those out of the sky. The reason why we don't is because the Iron Dome is expensive. Actually, every time we fire a shot with the Iron Dome, it costs about $50,000. Um, so if it's not going towards a uh, civilian center, we don't, we don't shoot it out of the sky. Um, the ones that we decided to shoot out of the sky, we hit, um, like I said, 97% of them. Um, and not only has the Iron Dome itself become, you know, highly accurate, um, but we're actually working on new technology now to be able to, to shoot these, these projectiles out of the sky with a laser. So that's coming soon. Um, so that's like the, the next. And, you know, one of the, I guess, fortunate benefits that the IDF has here is that our, our enemies are low tech in their strategies, you know, even though they've diverted billions of dollars into fighting against uh, Israel, the Zionist enemy. Um, most of that money has gone into uh, low-tech rockets. They, they fired thousands of them against us. But, you know, if you consider that they fired, you know, close to 1,200 rockets, 1,150 or so rockets at Israel, how many people were killed with those rockets? Actually, not a single one. Um, you know, I think from what I read, I believe that an Israeli had a heart attack running to a... Uh, wanting to uh, shelter and, and died, which is, you know, that's a tragedy. But if you consider that they fired um, close to 1,200 rockets at Israel and one person died from having a heart attack, um, that's, not a, that's not a military success. You know, that's pretty low tech in terms of what they're firing and, and some of their, their other um, funds have been diverted over the years towards terror tunnels, which are meant to penetrate Israeli soil from underground. And Israel also has been able to root out these tunnels and we're able to block them from entering Israeli territory with a underground wall that we have that goes something like 20 meters underground. Uh, we also have advanced radar and other technologies and surveillance that are able to root out these terror tunnels. If you remember from May 2021, Israel actually bluffed uh, a ground incursion into the Gaza Strip. And then what happened was that all of the Hamas terrorists ran inside the tunnel network that they had built. And then Israel bombed the tunnel, tunnel network and, and killed many terrorists, you know, just by, um, by force faking, bluffing them to run into the tunnels. And at the, that time, Israel actually produced maps of what they call the Hamas uh, subway system, these underground tunnels. So, you know, we're very fortunate to have uh, low-tech enemies that they're, you know, they're, they're persistent um, and they invest everything that they have into trying to wipe us out. But fortunately for Israel, they, they, don't, <laughs> they don't have the technology to uh, match the, the superior technology of the IDF. Um, now, it should be noted that even though we, we fought against Palestinian Islamic Jihad in Gaza, um, there is a wider campaign to deal with terror, um, and it, not just limited to Palestinian Islamic Jihad and not just limited to Gaza. Um, and a few, the few days before uh, this uh, small um, strike in hostilities in, in Gaza, that uh, on the 3rd, of August, the IDF arrested Bassam El Sayadi, who was the head of the Palestinian Islamic Jihad in Judea and Samaria. And it was this arrest actually that sort of led to intelligence um, that Palestinian Islamic Jihad was planning to retaliate. Um, and the intelligence, according to the intelligence, uh, 
they were going to shoot anti-tank missiles at Israeli population centers. So that might have been a new strategy employed by the Palestinian Islamic Jihad. What Israel did at that time was actually to lock down uh, all the communities in the Gaza envelope. Uh, you know, I had a friend of mine call up from a community along the Gaza envelope, and he said, what's going on over here? You know, the, it was really the first time that Israel had locked down a community over a, a terrorist threat. Like we've had intifadas in Jerusalem and West Bank and Judea and Samaria. Um, and we've never locked down the communities before. So this was something where um, it was a, a new a new strategy, perhaps uh, that we took to to do the lockdown. But at some point, um, either we we're going to have to release the citizens from their lockdown or to take action. And that is kind of when we went back in. But there's been other other uh, attacks, uh, other attacks by the IDF against uh, terrorist entities inside Judea and Samaria. Um, we took out the lion of uh, of Nablus, uh, Ibrahim Nabulsi. Um, in uh, a member of the Al-Aqsa Martyr Brigades last week uh, in, in Nablus. Um, we have continued to strike against Palestinian Islamic Jihad in the West, in Judea and Samaria. You know, those areas are known as the West Bank, uh, according to the international community and to, by the Palestinians. Um, and so they're, they're, we're not out of the woods. We've definitely taken out Palestinian Islamic Jihad in Gaza. Um, have we develop deterrence, which will keep us from hostilities for more than 12 months or more than 14 months like we got this last time. It's, it's hard to know if we've established that kind of deterrence. There's definitely still a simmering war um, in Judea and Samaria, which may rear its head uh, once again. So there's a, a number of different questions. Um, we saw actually this week that uh, Fatah, the Palestinian Authority, actually arrested 17 members of Palestinian Islamic Jihad uh, who had uh, explosives on them and were presumably preparing an, at an attack. So on the one hand, you know, we have some coordination with the Palestinian Authority. On the other hand, we have some uh, coordination with Hamas. Um, there are still rad radical Islamic uh, jihadis uh, inside all of these territories, and it remains to be seen um, whether we are able to establish uh, deterrence. Um, those are, I think, some of the majors uh, that we we can we can deal with. Um, I can take questions. I can talk about uh, the Israeli political scene a little bit. Mm -hmm. I can talk about international responses. Um, you tell me, uh, Sarah, where where you'd like this to go? If you That's have any questions, excellent, excellent. As usual, Alex, you never disappoint. Um, just a couple of things in case our viewers don't remember this, but um, we find it to be absolutely cowardly for members of Pij and Hamas and even Fatah to um, hide themselves among their families and to hide themselves um, in um, highly populated areas. So if there are, you know, uh, precision targeted um, efforts to take out the commanders of Pidge or Hamas or Fatah or any other enemy of the Jewish state, depending on who is wa waging war on it at the time, it's inevitable that there will be civilian casualties. So I think it shows their total lack of regard for the precious human lives of their children. Plus, um, the indoctrination, you know, is really toxic, and that has been going on forever. And until we are able to finally rid the UNRWA camps of this, this horrific indoctrination, um, which we have been trying to do for decades, this is going to go on. It's inevitable if they, you know teach kids the glorification of martyrdom and, um, a, a, you know, extol, you know, virtues of having Palestine from the river to the sea and not recognizing the state of Israel, etc. It's inevitable that these kids are going to want to grow up to martyr themselves. Um, with that, I just um, have one other point, and that is, um, we noticed on August 1st how President Biden was absolutely gloating 
about the killing of Ayan um, Zawahari. Um, an Al-Qaeda leader. Um, yet, um, the world seems to still want to condemn Israel for the killing of Pish commanders. Um, um, Jabari and Khalid amassing on the borders of America to attack missiles on, on the United States from Al-Qaeda recently. Yet Israel is in this horrific position of having to defend its people, yet there are always going to be criticisms. Um, Alex, can you talk a bit about the criticisms? Yeah, so we definitely still got them. Uh, you know, I think you pointed out uh, correctly in one of your press releases that uh, a lot of the headlines um, in the opening days of the conflict were, you know, along the lines of Israel kills 10 militants and offensive, you know, that it, and on the one hand, we did launch the offensive first. I mean, we did that with intelligence, um, but you know, the the classic mili the classic media coverage of Israel, you know, is you know that Israel's the aggressor uh, in any kind of situation. The Palestinian narrative is usually, you know, it all started when he hit me back. Um, so we did see a lot of that. On the other hand, I will say that I think for a couple of different reasons, um, the a response to Israel's aggression were, I would say, one or two degrees less than than usual. I, I think that uh, perhaps it was be, like you mentioned that uh, America had taken out an Al Qaeda uh, target um, on the same week, and that would have led to a bit of a, uh, you know, a bit of a. Uh, it would have been hypocritical for the United States and others to to target, uh, you know, to to target Israel uh, when they just did essentially the same thing, and they also did it against uh, against a terror threat that ne wasn't necessarily uh, planning active attack on Americans. Uh, here we we knew that uh, Palestinian Islamic Jihad was planning uh, active attacks. Um, two, I think that we communicated um, very clearly to America and others. In advance that it was going to be a very limited operation with very uh, significant strategic targets uh, being taken out and that we would not continue the uh, the hostilities longer than uh, what it would take to, to take out the strategic targets, which were known in advance. Um, and then there was also, um, you know, we saw a very unusual article from the AP, uh, which was uh, basically almost congratulating uh, Yair Lapid for uh, succeeding uh, in his, in his uh, campaign. Um, and you saw there that uh, much of Israel and the international media to that extent, you know, um, want Yair Lapid to be the prime minister and not Benjamin Netanyahu. And you could be almost certain that had Netanyahu been the prime minister and had launched this attack, that you might have seen even, even more hostility towards Israel in the media. So they were kind of giving Lapid a pass because you have to understand that in Israel, that one of the things that uh, Lapid lacks is security experience. And so uh, you know, getting that security experience, uh, something that uh, Lapid will lean heavily on uh, in the election will, will help him. And uh, it, the Israeli media knows that. And so they communicate with many of the members of the foreign press here. Um, and I think that that chain of events actually led to some uh, easier coverage. Um, but you know, Israel has to be on top of its game uh, at all times and, and to recognize that it, it's the diplomatic warfare against the Jewish state that really is, is the big threat. And as I mentioned to you, they fired 1,150 rockets, 1,170 rockets at Israel, and those don't destroy the state of Israel. They barely kill an Israeli. So really the way this works is that they fire missiles or they threaten to fire, uh, trying to draw Israel into a conflict. And then when Israel gets drawn into a conflict, that's when the international community does their part of fighting the narrative war, you know, the diplomatic assault against the state of Israel. Um, and uh, I think that Israel is slowly trying, slowly able to make gains in this battlefield as well. And so I, I think that things were a little bit better uh, than they were in the past, but 
I think we were very much helped by the fact that we were able to control the speed uh, and the tenacity of the campaign by launching it on our own terms, um, keeping Hamas and Hezbollah out, uh, going against like the lowest tech enemy that we we could go after and and stopping as soon as possible. And if you if we would have had a wider a wider campaign that might have included Hamas or might have included Hezbollah in the north, um, then you don't have those same controlled uh, circumstances. So, um, you know, it's still it's still a battle, but certainly the diplomatic assault is uh, sometimes more painful than the uh, assault of the rockets. And now it's my supreme pleasure to turn this over to my wonderful colleague, Hussein Abubakar Mansour, who will read the questions that have come in. Hussein? Thank you very much, Sarah. And thank you very much, Alex, for being with us today and, and having such a timely and, and excellent presentation. And thank you very much for all our viewers and audience who are uh, uh, watching us right now. And thank you for all those uh, who sent us questions. I will go through the questions that we received uh, from the audience, and hopefully we'll have the time to go through all of them. Uh, the first question that we have is actually about Iran. How close is the Palestinian Islamic Jihad uh, to Iran? And would it be fair to consider uh, uh, now Gaza to and the terrorist organizations in Gaza to be a part of the Iranian threat against Israel? Oh, absolutely. I think that's a very, very important point that I should have probably brought up in the first part of the part of the presentation. Now, on the very first day that uh, this campaign was launched, Palestinian Islamic Jihad Secretary General Ziad al-Nakari met with Iranian President uh, Ibrahim Raisi. Uh, he also met with the head of the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, the, RG the IRGC, um, and Hossein Salami, who's the commander of the IRGC, told uh, al-Nakari that Iran is with you on this path until the end and that Israel will pay another heavy price. Um, the, they are completely funded by Iran. So Iran's uh, tentacles, we know, we know that Iran has tentacles all over the Middle East, including in Yemen and Iraq, in Syria and southern Lebanon in Gaza and also in Judea and Samaria through Palestinian Islamic Jihad. So yes, you know, Israel has attacked uh, Iran on its own soil, taking out Iranian nuclear scientists and uh, other sabotage of uh, Iranian nuclear facilities and the like. And there, there is a, a battle going on between Iran and the state of Israel. In this case, it uh, manifests itself through Palestinian Islamic Jihad. Um, thank you. Um, so you just mentioned that Iran funds the, the Palestinian uh, Islamic Jihad. So that money goes there and gets converted into missiles. Uh, we have questions from the audience asking, well, how do they get to build those mi missiles? How do they get to those raw materials? Do they enter through Egypt? Do they enter through, uh, through Israel? How is it that they get away with this industry of manufacturing those rockets? Well, yeah, first of all, you will notice that, uh, as I mentioned, that you have low-tech rockets in, uh, in Gaza versus the types of long-range, uh, precision-guided missiles that uh, Hezbollah has been stockpiling in southern Lebanon. And the reason why they're able to stockpile more sophisticated weaponry is because of the land bridge directly between Iran, Iraq, Syria, and southern Lebanon. And that's why um, you know, Israel has been attacking inside Syria to stop those weapons transfers. Um, the, the Qassam rockets in Gaza are manufactured in Gaza and they're used, they're manufactured using materials that, that are available in Gaza, you know, and, uh, you know, they part of what always gets negotiated after these conflicts is what types of uh, materials Israel will allow into the Gaza Strip. So for example, they always talk about how much cement will Israel allow into the Gaza Strip. But then Israel turns around and says, but they're using the cement not for buildings and infrastructure, they're using it for underground tunnels. And it's the same thing with, with various uh, metals that they use to make the rockets. So a lot of this material actually comes in uh, through border with Israel. Um, so Israel proved that it has a extremely precise uh, arms and missile technology that can target with amazing and astonishing accuracy uh, personnel and individuals and, and able to take out specifically uh, jihadist leadership. Uh, we have questions from our audience asking, why doesn't Israel 
do this all the time and completely rid us of all of the jihadist leadership, um, whether even in the West Bank or, or, or in the Gaza Strip, or did Israel, or and if so, why did Israel settle uh, with kind of this new routine of, you know, as you know, a, episodic uh, conflict in which, you know, Israel goes out, manages the situation, clips the nails, and then goes back. Yeah, you're right. It's a kind of like mowing the grass uh, strategy that Israel's been employing uh, over the last uh, over the last several years, and I think that part of that has to do with what we were talking about just a few minutes ago with the international uh, diplomatic assault against the state of Israel. So Israel really prefers uh, to try to um, mow the grass, create a deterrent or attempt to create a deterrent and then hold the calm for as long as possible, right? And that's kind of the strategy that Israel has been preferring. And maybe there's been some success in, in Gaza, as you could see also, even in between campaigns, um, like if we look at the campaigns in 2019 versus 2021, and even to 2022, is that Israel's technology just gets better and better and better. So, you know, Israel can... Uh, improves its ability to, let's say, mow the grass with more efficiency. Um, and so the, the hope is that as Israel puts some of that on display, that they can they can create some kind of deterrence and then use like a carrot stick approach to to trying to keep keep quiet. And you and we also saw afterwards um, that Yair Lapid he kind of appealed to the to the Arab public living in Gaza and telling them that there's another way and that we it's not our goal to be in a constant conflict with the Gaza Strip. In fact, we would prefer not to be in conflict with Gaza. Uh, and we prefer not to be in conflict uh, in Judea and Samaria. Now in Judea and Samaria, because you have a situation in which you have um, hundreds of thousands of Israelis living interspersed uh, with well over a million Palestinians, um, you, the interaction is more direct. Um, and the terror threat is uh, is real, right? So, for example, in Judea and Samaria, you can have you can have uh, drive-by shootings, you can have different types of uh, roadside bombings or stabbing attacks or things like this, which you have to manage um, on a rolling basis, as opposed to as opposed to the situation in Gaza, where they literally have to fire across a border. And firing across a border, that invites like a larger campaign. So that's why you see different styles of fighting between uh, Israel and its enemies in Judea and Samaria versus Israel and its enemies in Gaza. Thank you very much. Um, we have a question actually about the missiles or the rockets that the, the Palestinian Islamic Jihad used and, and launched. Was it all from their inventory or did they use or did Hamas give them access to their own inventory to use against Israel? Yeah, that's a good question. I, you know, I think that I, I don't have a definitive answer, um, but seeing that uh, Hamas was doing everything that it could uh, to stay out of this conflict, um, I think that uh, if Israel had determined that Hamas missiles were being fired at Israel, uh, then you would you'd be able to accuse Hamas of joining the conflict. It doesn't necessarily matter who's pulling the trigger on those launchers. Um, but, you know, the, these may all be coming from the same factories, right? So, you know, Hamas gets some and Palestinian Islamic Jihad gets some. Um, but, you know, it was clear that we had preferred to, to take out the, what we deemed to be the more extreme uh, Palestinian Islamic Jihad here and, and to keep Hamas out of it. Thank you. Um, how substantial is Gaza's economy's dependence on on Israel? Uh, how much are the is their population dependent on food from Israel, medicine from Israel, water, electricity, and, and so on, and employment, yeah, of course. Absolutely, yeah. So Gaza is very much dependent on Israel. I mean, supplies flow in both from the Egyptian border and through the Israeli border. Uh, there is coordination that takes place on a regular basis between Gaza and Israel. One of the big sticks uh, that's been offered by uh, Defense Minister Benny Gantz and, and I guess also by Yair Lapid and Naftali Bennett as the Prime Minister before was to increase the number of permits for Gazans to come into Israel in order to gain employment because uh, someone working in Israel, even on a low wage uh, construction salary in Israel will make 
is t- twice or three times as much as someone working in Gaza. So right now, I believe that uh, something like 14,000 work permits uh, for Gazans coming into Israel uh, ha- have been issued. And, and Israel, in fact, right after the hostilities said that they were going to enable those permits to be, to be honored. Um, so we're definitely trying with uh, both with the carrots. Uh, oh, sorry, I, I said stick, but I meant carrots. This is a carrot to be offering to uh, you know to the citizens of Gaza and to and and Hamas also doesn't want to lose this carrot. So that's part of what uh, Israel is able to to do in its coordination with Hamas and to say, hey, if you if you enter this, not only. Uh, are we going to take out your senior leadership or we're going to take away these permits? Now, obviously 14,000 permits out of a population of more than one and a half million is barely a drop in the bucket, but uh, it seems to make a difference to Hamas. Thank you. Uh, I want to apologize to all our audience that we're not going to get through to all of their questions. Uh, actually, if Alex uh, has to leave a little earlier, uh, so I have only very few minutes left. So I'm going to go ahead and ask the last question. We received a number of questions about actually uh, the role of Egypt and uh, Qatar um, in the mediation uh, to, to reach a ceasefire. How do you see those roles? Uh, do you see, for example, if the Egyptian role now that is kind of rising again to prominence is, is an asset or a, a determinant, uh, as well as the Qatari role. Right, so uh, Egypt has been playing an increasing role um, in its coordination with the state of Israel, and it was Egypt that brokered the ceasefire. Uh, the reason why Egypt brokers the ceasefire is because Israel will trust them as a broker to, to deal uh, directly you know, with that they can trust and also that they know have direct line to Hamas. Um, Israel views uh, Egypt as a potential stabilizing force in, in the region. We saw in uh, February of this year that uh, the foreign minister of Egypt actually participated in the Negev summit together with the uh, foreign ministers of Israel, United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, and, and Morocco. Uh, so, you know, they don't really want to be left out by this process of the Abraham Accords. And so they are trying to uh, demonstrate their uh, usefulness for the state of Israel. And also in the last uh, period, uh, Israel and Egypt have um, signed contracts to um, export Israeli natural gas uh, to Egypt and potentially even looking at Egypt as a partner for exporting natural gas uh, all the way to Europe. Um, so they certainly have have a role to play there. Uh, Qatar, they send significant sums of money into, uh, into the Gaza Strip and support Hamas. So uh, even though they're not necessarily known to be a... Um, you know, uh, a very pro-Israel uh, government, they still have a certain amount of usefulness because there is there is the sense among Israeli uh, officials that you want Gaza to have money. You want them to be able to function because when you have greater unemployment and that's when people ha- get more bored, they don't have what to do, they get more angry and then they have to turn their their frustration somewhere and oftentimes they turn that at, at Israel. So when when Hamas can't provide uh, salaries you know, for, for citizens living in Gaza, um, that's when... Uh, Arabs living there will turn to other entities like Palestinian Islamic Jihad. Okay, with that, we're going to have to thank Alex Trayman. He's in very popular demand. Um, he, he is an absolute gem, and we rely on him always for his um, brilliance, um, his analytic skills, and his wisdom. Um, so, Alex, um, I just would like people to also be beyond contributing to Amet at www.ametonline.org. Uh, if you can also um, contribute to JNS.org, um, we'd really, really appreciate that in order to help sustain the work of both of our organizations. And thank you so much, Alex, again. Um, And thanks to all of our audience who sent in questions. We apologize if we weren't able to get to every one of them. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thanks, Sarah. Bye-bye. Bye.